Okay, so we, we are, we are, uh, we are on to the last topic of the course here. Um, and so this is, uh, in, in, your in your textbooks, this will be chapter 22, section 4. We're doing damping today. Our one, last, our one last topic in vibrations where we focus on the issue of friction and damping just with the simple fact that in real life, your vibrations, the vibrations that you do, do not oscillate forever, do not oscillate inf uh, indefinitely. They have to dampen out at some point and basically then just stop oscillations. So how do we include this damping effect where there might be friction involved, et cetera? And so the way we do this is we redraw our diagram to look like the following. So we still have our spring mass system, okay? And what we do is we add something called a damper. So this is our damper. Oftentimes it's called a dash pot. So a dash pot or damper. And the idea behind this damper is just like anything that you would expect, is that it is proportional to how fast something is moving. So a force that is applied against its direction of motion to slow it down. So that is the whole idea behind it. It applies a force to slow down motion. Okay. And because of that, you basically get the following. We're going to give the mass the constant or the, the value m for um, the symbol m for its, uh, its mass in kilograms. Spring is our spring constant k. And so the symbol for our, uh, for our damper is a constant c. And the way this works is you're going to draw your free body diagram. It's going to be our m. And you're going to do your typical x is equal to 0 positive x to the right, for instance, in these model systems. And the way you draw the free body diagram then becomes kx to the left as the spring force proportional to the displacement, so how far it is away from neutral position. And then this one here for the damper is a cx dot. So we'll call this our FD for D for damper, and this is a negative CX dot. And so the negative sign for opposing direction of velocity. Okay, so that's what the minus sign is for. And then X dot obviously means that uh, is for the velocity. And then our C is now what we call the damping coefficient. Okay. And based on the units, you can tell that the C has to be a force per unit velocity. So the units have to be a newton second meter, All right? So there's an extra second on the, in the numerator for the units because it is an x dot that is multiplied to not an x. Okay, and then a, a quick note here in this section, ignore forcing functions. So you know how last section that we've been dealing with, we called it undamped forced. So we were doing forced vibrations where I had a hand and I was basically moving the mass with a, with a forcing function on the right hand side. I'm going to say ignore forcing functions in this section and only worry about the damping. So where does that leave you when it comes to our equation of motion? It's going to be sum of forces in the x is my mAx or mx double dot. And now it becomes, instead of just minus kx, it'll be minus kx minus cx prime. 
uh, CX dot. Okay, and no forcing function, so you rearrange. Okay, and so we have a new differential equation to deal with. This is similarly a second order constant coefficient ordinary differential equation with now three constants instead of two. We have the n, the k, and now a c. And then reminder that we are ignoring everything on the right hand side, it is just zero. Okay? So have you guys seen how this ordinary differential equation is solved in your calculus class? Should have, right? So the way we solve this is we need to assume two solutions. Okay, and the two solutions are all exponentials. Right? So instead of sinusoidals, we should expect exponentials. And the reason, the reason is actually really clear, right? If you assume an exponential, so I'm going to say, let's say we do the following. You do a guess that x of t is equal to just the typical, I guess it's an e lambda t, right? So a typical e to the lambda t where lambda is some constant related to uh, the time or the frequency of the system. Then what do you get when you do your x dots and your x double dots? You're just going to get a simple derivative that puts the lambda out in front, so lambda e to the lambda t, and then x double dot is lambda squared e to the lambda t. Right? And this works out great, because as soon as I plug these guys in there, I'm going to actually end up with a, what we call a characteristic equation that looks like a quadratic, a quadratic equation solved by the quadratic formula. Let's do that. So sub into ODE, and you're going to get the following. It's going to be an M, and then a lambda squared e to the lambda t, plus C lambda e to the lambda t, plus K e to the lambda t is equal to 0. Right? So this guy is not 0, which means that to solve this, you set this second order polynomial to be 0. And then if you get the lambdas, then you know the exponents that should be sitting in the spots where the exponential solutions are. Yeah. I'm getting to the real and complex part in a second, but uh, basically it's not, that, it's not that I lucked out with this guess, is that you can guess anything else and you'll realize that it will not lead you to the solution. So the exponentials is what um, is the solution that solves that particular ODE. Okay? So you can guess, you can guess anything, right? Guess, a, guess a, a cubic function if you want, you know, guess trig functions, and you'll soon see that they don't solve that ODE. Okay, so are we, are we good with this step? So far, so good, right? Nothing else new except for, uh, for that one C x dot term, which led us to another ODE, and now we have to solve for that. So, okay, so what do you do next? You typically do the following. You use a quadratic formula. Part of this might be a repeat of your calculus class, but this is, it's nice, right? Because in that class, perhaps everything was a bit abstract. Everything was just mathematical symbols. Here, I'm going to make that connection for you. What is the physical meaning behind these symbols and these specific solutions? So if I use the quadratic formula to solve for my two roots, 
right? We call these the roots of the solution. The roots of the characteristic equation, right? Okay, so what do we do? We just basically end up with the following. We say lambda 1, lambda 2, these are the two solutions. They must be equal to minus b plus or minus square root of b squared, right, minus 4ac. So what do we get here? It should be negative c plus or minus square root c squared minus 4mk divide by 2m. Okay, and then I'll do a little bit of cleaning up here. Lambda 1, lambda 2. Let's clean this up and make it look like the following. Negative c over 2m, and then I'm going to move the the 2m inside of the square root here. So it should look like that. Because when the 2m goes inside the square root, it becomes a 4m squared. So then it just easily gets combined into these other parts of the square root. And so this is the, la the way that we, write, we like to write our we like to write our roots in this particular course. OK? OK, so we've, we've arrived at the roots of the solution, but clearly we are going to eventually run into an issue because we've got three parameters that could be any values. And when you combine them, they could result in three different scenarios of what happens underneath the square root. We actually get three different scenarios. And I'm going to write them here. I think you can already guess what they may be. So the first one is everything under the square root is just equal to 0. So we're going to say that this is our c over 2m squared minus k over m. First one is it's just equal to 0, and we actually end up with only one possible root here, one possible lambda, which is insufficient, right? And so in your calculus class, they'll tell you, if you end up with this very special case, how do we go about getting the two solutions again, right? So we'll talk about that. Scenario number two, c over 2m squared minus km greater than 0. Okay, so quite, quite easily, this one becomes just a positive number. Square root of it stays positive. Plus or minus gives you your two roots. And to get to that student's question here, this is where the complex stuff comes in. I'm going to give you the case where this is less than 0. And when it's less than 0, we have to contend with a minus sign inside of the square root, which will lead to the imaginary number. OK, all starting to sound very familiar, right? OK, so physically, this is what it means, OK? If we have scenario number one equal to 0, we call this the critically damped case. So we have, we have exactly what I said. We have a repeated real root. You can actually solve for this particular equation by doing the following. So I could rearrange this and say that c over 2m must therefore be, move the km over on that side, square root of k over m. In fact, that means that c is 2m k over m. 
And in other words, this one is 2m omega n. This k over m, which involves a spring constant in the mass but no c, is clearly the natural frequency of the system if there weren't any damping. So this quantity here, the 2m multiplied by an omega n, this is a c, the one c in your entire system that gives you this quantity, this critically damped case of equal to 0. And we, in fact, give it a special name for the C. We say it is the critical damping factor, C critical, 2m omega n. OK? And so this one has a specific name. And I'll give you the name here, critical damping coefficient. Okay? Now, we still have to deal with the issue, right? How do we get two solutions? Remember, in our undamped free vibration case, our two solutions were sine and cosine. Nice and easy. Here, we want to have two exponentials, one with the lambda 1 and one with the lambda 2, but we can't. So the solution for repeated root, I'm just going to give it to you. It'll be like the following. It'll be a e lambda t, where lambda is understood to be lambda 1 equal to lambda 2. It's the same lambda. And we're going to add this to b t e to the lambda t. You should have seen this before, right? When you have a repeated root, you've got no choice in the case of exponentials, but you've got to add this extra t as the independent variable to serve as the product here that gives you the second solution, right? OK, so I'm, I'm going to save you the trouble of mathematically deriving this. I'm just going to give you this particular solution, OK? But even though I've given it to you and I haven't derived it mathematically from first principles, it's a good idea to at least check, right? In this course, we should at least check. So if I do x dot, here's how we check, right? You do your derivatives, so a lambda e to the lambda t plus this guy requires a product rule. So it's got to be derivative of this times this plus this times the derivative of that, right? Okay, and then our x double dot is going to be, so I'll just give this to you, a lambda squared e lambda t plus, and then this one becomes b lambda e lambda t, and then you can see another product rule shows up. And you're going to plug all three of these into our ordinary differential equation. And it should all uh, make sense in terms of making the left-hand side, right-hand side, and all the coefficients match. Okay? So this is your solution when the case is critically damped. Okay? And I'll also make a note here, right? Note that, note that for critically damped, so what did I show you? I showed you that it's equal to 0, and I even proved to you a special, a special critical damping coefficient. But I still have to tell you exactly what the lambda is. Lambda, in every single one of these cases, Lambda must be the negative c over 2m. All right? That's the, that's the thing that was outside the square root, if the square root is 0, right? So this is 0, gives you this guy. And so that's your lambda in everything that I wrote here. And just wait a second, there's an even simpler form of this lambda, this c has no choice but to be our C critical. So I'm going to plug in my C critical here, because it is the only one that works 
to give us critically damped. And this is our 2m omega n divided by 2m. So lucky for us, our lambdas are just negative omega n. Okay? So to summarize, summarize your solution is going to be this a e negative omega n t b t right that is the solution where it is critically damped and you end up having to solve for a and b once you're given the initial conditions okay so that is scenario Number one. Okay, scenario number two. I'm going to do the easy one where it's greater than zero. C over 2m squared minus k over m greater than zero. In other words, if I calculate at C critical, I'm basically saying that the C is bigger than C critical. Right? That my condition is such that this damping coefficient that's built into the system is damping things faster than what I calculated for my critically damped case. And we call this overdamped. Okay, and this is the easy case, right? This is what happens when you get the following. It's basically you have your two roots, and you've got one of the cases where one of the cases where it's a plus sign here. So this is my lambda one, and then your second case is you got a lambda two, and it is just the other sign, the negative sign. So these are your lambda 1s and lambda 2s, and they're both real numbers, nothing imaginary about them. And because you have two roots that are independent of each other, is everything okay? Yeah, did I, if I make a mistake, let me know. X of t is going to be what? It's going to be the following. A e to the lambda 1t, b e to the lambda 2t, like that, right? Where the lambda 1 and lambda 2 are just this. All right. So finally, on to our third scenario. C over 2m minus k over m less than 0. OK? So this one is termed underdamped. And I want to show you in this particular case how the solution does come about uh, because it's probably the most interesting one that you'll see in terms of the final response. So I'm going to do the following. Let me rewrite this as lambda 1 comma lambda 2. Okay, so clearly the value inside of the square root is going to be negative and it's not going to be helpful to us, but what we can do is I can reverse these terms, basically multiply it by negative 1 on purpose. And what's that going to do is going to introduce for us the square root of minus 1, which is the imaginary number i.
multiply by minus 1 inside this. So basically, everything stays the same. And the purpose of multiplying it by minus 1 is it allows me to flip this guy over. And now, because it was previously negative, it is now positive. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to define a new variable for this particular part of the square root. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to say lambda 1, comma lambda 2. So I'm going to first take, sorry for writing this multiple times, but just to be absolutely clear, so the square root minus 1 becomes my i. And I'm going to define this to be a new variable. Just to save on some writing. OK? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let omega d I'm going to let this value under the square root or the whole the whole square root value I'm going to be making it equal to this omega d which is called the damped frequency oops let me see here let's make sure I got this part right So it's called a damped natural frequency. You can see that it would have the same units, radians per second, because it still has the k over m here. This one is the one that gives it away. It's related to the natural frequency itself. And it would be the same as the natural frequency if c was equal to 0, right? if there's no damping, or if you've assumed no friction. As soon as there's some friction or damping in the system, this thing has the tendency to make this guy smaller, right? So once you have a smaller value, it's like the damping frequency is a smaller frequency or lower frequency than the natural frequency of the system, OK? And it allows me to then write my two roots as follows. Lambda 1, lambda 2 equal to negative c over 2m plus or minus, much more simply, omega d i. OK? And I'll just add this for the benefit of your notes, where I OK, but you, uh, but you knew that already. OK, so where do we go from here? So since these are two unequal roots, we can clearly write the solution x of t as lambda 1 and lambda 2. We could write it like this, right? lambda 1, which means it's basically like me taking the whole thing and doing this, right? Negative c over 2m plus an omega di multiplied by a t, like that. Can you see that in the back there? Is that OK? Plus b, and then I'm going to do e negative c 2m, and then flip the sign to be a minus omega di t. I'm totally allowed to do that because just like the overdamped case, the two roots are actually unequal to each other, and I'm allowed to do that. 
The problem is we don't really want to deal with this imaginary number, right? Taking an, expo an exponential of an imaginary number, it's hard to understand the physical meaning behind that. So here's where I invoke some complex numbers. I'm going to do some factoring first. So my x of t is going to be, so the one thing that's common is my exponential. e to the c over 2m t. OK, so I'm going to factor that out. Leaves me with a e omega, omega dti, like that. Like the following. I'm going to introduce an identity in complex numbers. You guys will remember this, perhaps. What do you think is an exponential of an angle theta if it's taken to the imaginary times theta power? Right. It actually ends up being cosines and sines again, where the cosine is part of the real part of the complex number, and the sine is the imaginary part of the complex number, where these two are in the complex plane. OK, so what does that mean? It means that I can replace this theta now. Sorry if I mess up your notes, but I'm going to replace this theta with what we're typically using as the argument inside our trig functions. What if I just do a cosine omega dt like that, right? So this is my theta, right? OK? And basically what this means is anytime you see a combination of these two, they are actually just sines and cosines anyways. And so I can replace this with the sines and cosines solution from from my undamped free vibration case. So I'm just going to skip this part, but I can, I can prove to you if you want. It can be shown, famous words in math classes, right? It can be shown that this a e to the i omega dt plus b e to the negative i omega dt is simply equal to just some, some other set of two constants. And let's just say this is right. It's basically this is equal to this if this were the real part of the solution. You can just replace it. right? And you can look this up in any complex analysis textbook that you want. And this is essentially like my similar to free undamped vibrations, except that the one thing that's changed is that I have an omega d instead of an omega n. Okay? So now I can put this all together. Therefore, we have x of t oops, so I'm going to write this first as my m sine and cosine or the one that I like the most is actually the one with the, with the phase shift. And so with the phase shift, you basically have this.
So that is your final solution. And I'll remind you that things are looking very, very much like your undamped free vibration case in terms of the sine with the phase shift. The D is the amplitude. And this is the only difference. It's the exponential decay of the system. Okay? So I'll break this down for you further. Right, so we're going to say this one is our amplitude. And this is our oscillation. Right? Does that all make sense? So far, so good. Okay, and let me let me show you what what we typically do here. Obviously, we, we frequently ask you this. What does it look like when you graph this oscillation? What do you expect from it? And how can you get at some of the properties of this particular behavior? So on my x-axis, I have time, say in the unit of seconds. And this is my, my oscillation for the, the displacement from its neutral position x of t. So remember that I've got various phase shifts and things going on here. So I'm going to just do a dotted line. Right. So let's say that this particular dotted sine curve is at my amplitude d. So it's plus d above, minus d below. And I'm going to indicate to you here that when I hit the x-axis, this right here is my phase shift phi. Okay. Now this would be true if it wasn't decaying, right? So we have to add our decay on top of this. So our decay is the exponential part. You can imagine that it's going to do something like this all the way down to nothing. Right? And so the, as, the oscillation is actually happening between these two lines as if this is an exponential uh, envelope, keeping the oscillations in check. So it should look like this. Like the following. That would be your solution to this particular problem. This would be my D. Actually, let me draw this again. Let me, let me do this guy as my decay. So this would be E to the, like that. That's my decay part. OK, and omega D. Well, Clearly, we have a new period. Our period is associated with the damped natural frequency. So I'm going to say this is my period d, uh, tau d. And this would be a 2 pi over omega d. And you can imagine that after one cycle, right here, suppose it would be this part plus a little bit. So right here, this one would be my tau d. So I'll do this right here. Yeah. Sorry. Is the unit of time, is the phase shift in seconds or in radians? 
is the phase shift in seconds or radians? Everybody in this equation is the phase shift in radians or in seconds? Radians, yeah. Because it's added to this part, that should be radians as well. It's only if you do my, the typical way where I, I see where you're getting at, right? So this is, uh, let's do this. Thank you. Oh, WD, omega D, sorry. Thank you. Thanks for catching that. Okay, so let me let me wrap this up here. Because I know this was a this was a long, a long theoretical type lecture. I didn't even get to an example. I'll get to an example on Wednesday where I wrap up where I wrap up the, the course. Um, but let me just tie up some loose ends here. Um, let me just, for omega d, I'll give you another form of oops. Sorry? Is there an issue? Why is it over omega d? Because that's my time axis. So it would be, it would be like this. Omega d t plus theta over omega d. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So here's another form of the damped frequency. I'm going to factor out a k over m. Okay, so if I factor out this k over m, here's what you're going to get. A 1 minus a c over 2m squared. Okay, so I did, I did a, just a little bit of algebra here, right? I pulled out the omega n that I'm familiar with. When that pops out, I flip my m over k on this term. It becomes a 1 over omega n squared. I combine the stuff on the bottom. That's my c critical, right? It's just algebra, but it gives me a nice form to define something else. And we call this the damping ratio. So C over C crit is defined as the damping ratio. Okay. And the whole idea behind this is simply to say, remember that this is the underdamped case. In the underdamped case, your C is always less than C critical. Right? For underdamped case. Right? So if C is always less than C critical, this is always less than 1. The question is just how much less than 1 it is. Is it close to 1 or is it close to 0? And so this damping ratio gives you a sense of how long it's going to take for the damping to take place, for it to die to 0. And everything is multiplied. It's almost like a number between 0 and 1 multiplied to this omega n, the natural frequency. So it's really handy if you happen to know your damping ratio, the C versus C crit, you can easily calculate this, right? C crit is always just based on the spring and the mass that you have in the system. So if you can determine the critical damping coefficient, and then you take a look at the C of the system that's given to you, you're immediately going to figure out which scenario it is. Under damped, over damped, or critically damped. And then you go on from there to do your analysis to pick the solution that matches the problem. Okay? Any, any questions on that? Anything at all? Okay? 
I'll give you a little prelude here. So prelude next class when I do an example. The example is going to look like this. Spring, damper, spring, damper, spring. Right? So what do you do? You just figure out, remember whenever you've got multiple springs and multiple dampers, the C, the K, and the M that is inside of all these equations, they have to be the equivalent versions, right? As if you've taken this problem and you've simplified it down to just one spring, one equivalent spring and one equivalent damper, you got to get this to be this before you can proceed with getting your solution. And so I'm going to talk about, you know, springs in series, springs in parallel, dampers in parallel, etc. Okay? All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.